On today's show, why does Donovan Mitchell believe the Cavs can be championship contenders? That, and I've got questions for everybody on the roster as Media Day has arrived on today's Locked On Cavs. You are Locked On Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, everybody? My name is Danny Cunningham. You might know me from my time covering the Cleveland Cavaliers, places like 92.3 The Fan, Cleveland Magazine, and a number of other stops along the way. I want to say thank you for making Locked on Cavs your first listen today and every day. You can find the show anywhere you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, anywhere else. Make sure you drop us a five-star rating, leave a review. If you're new here, make sure you're subscribed too. It's media day today, so I know a lot of you are looking to get back into the world of the Cleveland Cavaliers, and I couldn't be happier to welcome you into Locked on Cavs. Also, make sure you're checking us out on YouTube. Just search Locked on Cavs on YouTube. Hit that like button if you're watching this video. Click subscribe and hit the notification bell as well so you know when bonus episodes of Locked on Cavs go up like one did last Friday after Coach Kenny Atkinson and President of Basketball Operations Kobe Altman spoke to the media at Cleveland Clinic Courts. And of course, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. You can start the season big with a big return on FanDuel. Place your first $5 bet and you will get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. So for today's show, what I have done is I have put together one question for all 17 guys that we expect to have on the roster for the Cleveland Cavaliers at Media Day. So I've got the 14 guys that are on standard NBA contracts and then the three guys that are on two-way deals. So we will talk a little bit about JT Thor. We'll talk a little bit about Imani Bates and we will talk a little bit about Luke Travers. But I, I need to start with Donovan Mitchell because that obviously him signing with the Cavs and extension this summer was the biggest thing that the Cavs did. It wasn't relieving J.B. Bickerstaff of his coaching duties, hiring Kenny Atkinson, extending Evan Mobley or Jared Allen. No, this summer started and for all intents and purposes ended with Donovan Mitchell signing a max contract extension in Cleveland. So the question that I have for Donovan Mitchell at Media Day, what needs to go right for this Cleveland Cavaliers team to be a championship contender? Because it is clear in interviews that he's given, He's I know he appeared on uh, Carmelo Anthony's podcast. I know he was interviewed for a story, I believe, with the undefeated. He, he's He's been out there. He's done some of these, or Anscaped, I'm sorry. He's done some interviews, and he's mentioned that he believes Cleveland can be a championship contender if things go right, if they stay healthy. Well, what things need to go right for them to be a championship contender? That That is the thing that I'm most curious to hear from Donovan Mitchell because he is, after all, the best player on this roster by far. He's terrific. He's been nothing short of a superstar throughout his time in Cleveland. He's finished sixth in MVP voting his first year here. I think he probably would have been on some MVP ballots last year had he stayed healthy. I anticipate him to be an All-NBA player again this year. I think he's going to continue getting better too. Like I don't think that he has plateaued or peaked as a player. I think he's still growing. I think he's still getting better. But he is a player that has not gotten out of the second round of the playoffs in his career. The Cavs made it to the second round this past year, and that's as far as he's been. Now, he's been there a couple of times in Utah, but he's not gotten past that stage. If he believes this team can be a true championship contender, can be a team that can hoist the Larry O'Brien trophy at the end of the year, what needs to go right? For that to be the case, what do the Cavs need to do to put themselves in that position to where they can say, hey, we are at the same level as the Boston Celtics, as the Denver Nuggets, the Minnesota Timberwolves, the Oklahoma City Thunder, the New York Knicks, the Sixers, the Bucks, on and on and on. What needs to go right for the Cavs to be there? That is the thing that I want to know from Donovan Mitchell. What needs to go right? Is it just health? Is it gelling under Kenny Atkinson? Or does every player need to have a career year? Because some of those things I think are more likely than others. So that is the question that I have for Donovan Mitchell. I've put together questions for every single player on the roster. And next, I want to go to Evan Mobley. Because I think Mobley is probably the second most important player on the Cavs. Um, right now, I don't think he's the second best player on the Cavs. But I think he's the second most important player. Because how he develops is vital to really answering the question that I have for Donovan Mitchell. The question I have for Evan Mobley, where do you think that you have the most room to grow offensively? 
It was something that I asked Kenny Atkinson about Evan Mobley on Friday at his media availability about what the next step progression looks like for Evan Mobley on the offensive end of the court. But I'm curious to, to ask Evan where he thinks that is. Does he think it is him being in more of a playmaking position where he's in a situation where he can make others better? Is it stretching that range out and becoming a more potent, more, I don't want to say high volume three-point shooter, but a medium volume three-point shooter. Is that the next step for him? I think that would be a very logical place to go with this, where he's taking between four and six three-pointers a game. He's not going to be Brooke Lopez, um, as Kenny Atkinson said, but where's he going to fall in the middle? Is that the place where he can go? Or is it getting out in transition and showing off that athleticism, getting downhill, a word that we heard Kenny Atkinson mention a number of times on Friday when talking about Evan Mobley. Maybe it is something as, as simple as attacking the glass. I don't know what Evan Mobley thinks it is. I have a good idea of what I think Kenny Atkinson thinks it is, but does Evan Mobley's answer, is that the same one that Kenny Atkinson gave? Are those two in lockstep? I think the answer to that question for Evan will tell us a lot about how about how we're going to feel about his progression offensively, about how confident we are he's going to make that next step. He's got it within him. He does. The potential is there. I have zero question about that. Whether or not he can unlock that potential, that is the thing that is absolutely worth watching. That is the thing that I, I think is a big, big answer to Donovan Mitchell's question is, what does Evan Mobley look like offensively in year number four of his NBA career? That's a very important thing. That is what I have for Evan Mobley. Up next, Darius Garland. Now, we know last year Darius didn't have a good year. I've called it several times right here on this very podcast, a nightmare of a season for Darius Garland. So the question I have from him, how important was a reset this offseason after what was a tough year? Because there's no questioning last year was not good for Darius Garland. He didn't live up to expectations. He was injured multiple times. I believe he had some stuff going on off the court. It just was a year to forget. Now, it was a year that I'm willing to give him a pass on, especially if he goes out this year and has a good season and looks like the guy that made the all-star team the year before Donovan Mitchell got here or I thought played at an all-star level, Donovan Mitchell's first year here. But last year was unquestionably a step back. And sometimes, sometimes the best thing to do is to put your head down and work harder when you're trying to get past that, when you're trying to get over that. But sometimes the best thing to do is to take a step back and take a deep breath. And I don't know which route Darius chose to go. And it is very possible, you know, the Cavs haven't played a basketball game since May. It's possible, dare I even say likely, that it's probably a mix of both both of those routes where, you know, it's not as if Darius doesn't work hard every offseason. But I think this offseason for him, compared to what his year was, it might make a little bit more sense to say, hey, I need like a month where I don't even think about basketball, where I can just mentally reset, where I can take a deep breath. And sometimes that can be the best thing for someone. That can be the best thing for an athlete. And I, I do wonder if Darius was able to do that, what that sort of mental reset can do for him, what that did for him in terms of just finding, I, I don't even want to say finding the love of basketball again, because I have no reason to believe that went away, but sort of re-energizing him about finding a new motivation that's kind of what I'm curious, just where is Darius Garland at mentally after a year from just a nightmare of a season? That's what I've got for him because I do believe it's still there. Like Darius Garland did not all of a sudden just become not a great basketball player. I still think he's terrific. I think his stock is really low right now, but you know, if NBA players are in the stock market, I'm buying a ton of stock in Darius Garland. I've got a high belief in him. It's just, what did he do this summer? How did he handle what very clearly was a setback of a season? Lastly, in segment number one, I will get to, uh, I just wanted to handle the core four guys in segment number one. So Jared Allen is up next. And the question I've got for Jared, obviously he signed an extension. He's going to be in Cleveland or he's planning on being in Cleveland for a long time, signing this extension earlier this summer back on, I believe it was August 2nd. What made you want to extend in Cleveland? I do think Jared Allen has enjoyed his time here. I don't think he would have extended had he not. But I also think that Jared Allen probably could have gotten more money had he waited for free agency. Now, he had two years left on his current deal before this extension kicks in. So it's not as if he needed to extend or he was going to hit free agency.
But I do wonder why did he want to extend right now where he could have waited. The salary cap's going to keep going up. I think when, when he signed this past deal, we were kind of unsure about it because we really didn't know. We didn't see the full vision for Jared Allen as a player. But it was a five-year deal that was worth $100 million and it was flat. And now that's one of the best contracts in the NBA because he's not only lived up to that contract, I think he surpassed it in value. So he signs a new max for him contract extension that he's going to be making, I think it's like 16% of the salary cap or 18% of the salary cap. That's a really low number for a starting center, one that has made an all-star team. Why was this summer the right time to sign that extension? Why didn't he want to wait until he could sign for more money? Why didn't he want to wait to get to free agency? That I, I genuinely, I don't know the answer to that. I'm fascinated to see how he feels about it, why he thought that now was the right time to sign the extension. That is something that I I can't wait to see. I, I, I'm very fascinated to see why Jared Allen thought now was the right time for him to sign a contract extension. I'm not saying it was a bad thing. I think it was a great thing for the Cavs. But why did Jared Allen believe now was the time to do it? Got through the core four. That means we've got 13 more questions to get to. Up next is going to be Max Struess, friend of Locked on Cavs. What am I going to ask him? Find out next right here on Locked on Cavs. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. I've told you a lot about FanDuel. Why have I told you a lot about FanDuel? Well, because FanDuel is, of course, America's number one sports book. And this NFL season, which, you know, if you are a fan of the Cleveland Browns, yesterday wasn't a very fun Sunday. I uh, certainly know it wasn't for me watching that team lose that game to a team in Vegas that they are better than. But you can brighten up your Sundays with FanDuel because right now, if you – Place your first $5 bet with FanDuel. You will get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's a great way to put a smile on your face because win or lose that $5 bonus or that $5 bet, first bet on FanDuel, going to turn into $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Plus, one of the things I like about FanDuel, and I was using this actually during the Sunday night game last night between Buffalo and Baltimore, but you can go on the FanDuel app and you can check out the latest stats, you live play-by-play, which can be a little tricky if you're watching on a streaming service, but the live stats are a great tool and they can kind of help push you in one direction or the other if you want to make a live wager, which of course you can do on the FanDuel Sportsbook app. So FanDuel is the place to go when you're trying to get a little bit more out of your Sundays. It's the place everyone should be going. Why? Because FanDuel is America's number one sportsbook. And again, you can get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. So just head on over to FanDuel.com. That's F-A-N-D-U-E-L.com and you can get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Thank you again for making Locked on Cavs your first listen today and every day. Again, if you're new to the show, I very much appreciate you hopping aboard. This is a great time to be a Cavs fan. Media Day has obviously arrived. I cannot wait to get started talking about Cavs basketball. Uh, tomorrow's episode will be a recap of what happens today at Media Day, and I will then have live coverage from Florida. I will be talking on Locked on Cavs every day. Um, after the Cavs have their training camp practices at IMG Academy, I will be heading down there Monday night for the rest of the week. So I cannot wait for that. Basketball is is back, and I am so, so excited about it, and I hope you are too. So Max Struess is the next guy, the fifth member of the starting five. I do believe he will be the, the starting three this year again for the Cavs. I think it makes the most sense. And I, we talked about this a little bit when he was on Locked on Cavs a couple weeks ago. And if you missed that episode, go back. It's in your podcast feed. It's on YouTube. I had Max Struess on for about 20 minutes. He was a great interview. But one of the things we talked about is sort of having championship expectations. And Max is one of a few guys on this team that has played in in NBA Finals. So I want to ask him in a, a little bit of a different setting than the podcast is what does it take to get back to the Finals? where he's been there, he knows what it takes. He's been on deep postseason runs. I think really the only player on this Cavs team that has been on, has made more frequent deep postseason runs is Tristan Thompson, who obviously we know he was on quite a few deep postseason runs here in Cleveland. But what does it take to get back to that? What does it take and how is that something that can be instilled in the rest of this team? That is what I want to know from him because I, I know who Max is as a player. I think he's a really good player. I think he does a lot of things really well that don't necessarily show up in box scores. I think he's a winner. I think he's a player that you absolutely want to have on your roster when you're a good team. 
He might not have the best box scores. He's not going to blow you away stats wise, but I think he's a winner. And I think he knows what it takes to get to that next level. And I just kind of want to find out what it is. So that's what I've got for Max Drews. Up next, Karis LeVert. Karis, I don't know what the future is going to be for him after this year. He's going into a contract season. It's it's possible he can be dealt during the season. I think he's an attractive trade trip for some teams. But he's being reunited with Kenny Atkinson, who he played for early in his career in Brooklyn. So I do want to know, considering he has a little bit more experience than most playing for Kenny Atkinson here, of course, Jared Allen being the other guy that played with with Karras in Brooklyn under Atkinson. What does Karras think his ideal role in the offense for the Cavs this year should be? Because he has been somebody, and I think this has been a bit of a negative for him, not because of something he's done. But I think over the last few years when he's been in Cleveland, he's been put in a lot of different roles. And it's really difficult to find your footing when you are bouncing between so many different roles throughout a season. Think back to the first year Donovan was here, where Karras started that year as a starter, and then he moved to the bench, and then as injuries happened, he'd be in and out of the starting lineup. But it's just a difficult thing to balance. And then last year, we primarily did see him come off the bench. But what's his ideal role? How does he fit in? What is What can the Cavs do to get the most out of Karras LeVert? That is the thing that I want to hear the answer from Karis LeVert on. I want to know what he thinks the best way to get the most out of him is. Because if he is clicking, if he's playing his best basketball for the Cavs, the Cavs become a much more difficult team to beat. When they have the punch that Karis LeVert can provide off the bench, that is something that makes this team so much better and so much more difficult to defend. When one of Darius or Donovan Mitchell can go to the bench and Karis LeVert can come in and kind of pick up right where they left off. Like that is a very important thing for the success of this team. Up next, I've got Dean Wade. And I talked about this with Jackson Flickinger of Fear the Sword when he was on the show last week. But Dean Wade, I think, is one of the more irreplaceable players on the Cavs. Not because Dean Wade's the best player, not because he's one of the five best players, but he's a very good defender and he is somebody that they just don't have a replacement for. That's sort of what makes him irreplaceable. It's that they don't have guys that are his size that play that spot. So the question I have for him, and I wish I could just be like, so are you going to stay healthy? But that's not, you know, a legitimate question. The thing I have for him is, are you willing to be a more frequent three-point shooter? And we talked about this with Jackson last week, but Dean Wade is a good three-point shooter that doesn't shoot enough three-pointers. He shoots around six per 36 minutes on the floor. That's not a high enough clip for a guy that I believe can be a 40% three-point shooter that has shown he can at least be a 38, 39% three-point shooter. That number, I think for him, for the Cavs to get the most out of Dean Wade, that number needs to be up around eight and a half to 10 three-pointers per 36 minutes. Now, I'm not saying Dean Wade's going to be playing 36 minutes tonight because that's not going to be true. Like you're going to go to his per game number. And if you see seven, because he's taking seven three-pointers in 26 minutes, that's a really good place for the Cavs to be. That's a really, really good place for the Cavs to be. So is Dean Wade willing to do that? What is Dean Wade going to be able to do to make sure that number gets up there? I don't think that he has been as aggressive offensively as he could have been in the past. And I would like to see that change. Up next, Isaac Okoro. Okoro, we know, had a very long um, foray into restricted free agency where the Cavs signed him to a three-year deal a couple of weeks back. For him, I have the same question I have, Dean, I have for Dean Wade because Isaac Okoro last year was a very good three-point shooter, but he does not shoot them at a high volume. I don't know that I need to see him shoot as many three-pointers as Dean Wade does, but I'd like to see him shooting five a game six a game. I'd like to see him upping that volume so he is more valuable to the Cavs offensively. And I do think if he does that, defenses will start to respect him a little bit more and it will open up more of his offensive game. Because the one thing that I do think Isaac Crow has been consistent with is he's a good cutter to the basket. He does some things other than shoot the basketball well offensively. Now, I'm not saying I would trust him to go play point guard, but I do think that he can be useful offensively in ways other than just standing in the corner waiting for a pass to shoot an open three. I don't think that's the only thing he can do. But I think the more often he does that, the easier the other things become and the better he becomes at those other things. So how willing is he to up that volume of shots from the outside? And I understand as I talk about volume with a number of guys, you know, there aren't a ton of shots to go around for everybody. 
That's a problem to figure out, but I would like to have that problem rather than not. That's a problem I would like to try and figure out where can you get these guys the shots at. I don't know the answer right now, but I do think it's a problem that could be worth worth figuring out. Up next, the guys that you know we might not know a ton about, like Jalen Tyson or uh, maybe a guy in George Nying who had a really good stretch last year. How can you replicate that? The rest of the roster is straight ahead on Locked on Cavs. Today's show is brought to you by GameTime. GameTime is my go-to ticket place, and GameTime should be your go-to ticket marketplace. Cleveland Guardians are going to be playing playoff baseball this upcoming weekend at Progressive Field, the ALDS in town. Guardians number two seed in the AL. You're going to want to be there. I'm going to want to be there. If I'm going to want to be there, how do you think I'm going to get tickets? I'm going to download the GameTime app. I'm going to use the code LOCKEDONNBA, which I can't do because I've already made my first purchase, so it won't work for me. And then you'll get $20 off your first purchase with GameTime. Terms, of course, do apply, but GameTime should be the place that you should be going. One of the things that I love about GameTime is that you can toggle on the all-in pricing feature, and then you're not surprised by taxes and fees at the end. You don't get to check out and say, oh my goodness, I have to pay more money now? No, you can just say, hey, shoot it to me straight. Let me know what this is going to cost from the start. Game time allows that to be part of their process. It's one of the best things I think about the app. The other thing they do that I think is really, really cool, they'll show you what your view of home plate, center court, the stage at a concert, they will show you what that's going to be in the app. You can click on the seat and say, hey, I want to know what this is going to look like for me. Game time takes care of that. They make ticket buying easy. So like I said, Download the GameTime app today, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONNBA for $20 off your first purchase. That's code LOCKEDONNBA, L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-N-B-A for $20 off your first purchase. Terms, of course, do apply. What time is it? It's game time. Thank you again for making Locked On Cavs your first listen today and every day as we get through some of the questions that I have for every single member of the Cleveland Cavaliers with Media Day taking place today at Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse. Up next, the rookie, Jalen Tyson. First year in the NBA from Jalen. I want to know, what things can you do to stand out and earn minutes on this roster? I mentioned this on Friday's show. I think it was Friday's bonus episode that I don't think the Cavs have a lot of just bad basketball players. Like, I think this is a team that one through 14, there's, there are a lot of good basketball players that deserve minutes. Jalen Tyson is obviously the most unknown of those players because he's never played in an NBA minute as a 20th overall pick out of Cal. So what can Tyson do? What can he bring to the floor that says, hey, I deserve minutes? I have a few ideas of what those might be, like the fact that he's a really good rebounder, that I think he's a really good playmaker for his size. He looked very comfortable with the basketball in his hands in summer league. But what does Jalen Tyson think those things are? That's what I'm interested to see. Up next, Ty Jerome. We heard um, our kind of our our first little bit of a nugget of information from Kobe Altman on Friday about Ty Jerome. and, And he said that Ty Jerome was the MVP of September for the Cavs, that he had been balling in their their open gym workouts that they've been having. So Ty, for you, what's it been like being the MVP of September? In all seriousness, like how where's your game at right now? Because I think that he is the most forgotten player on the Cavs. We don't know. He played in two games last year and then just disappeared because of an ankle injury. I don't know what to expect out of Ty Jerome. I don't. I feel better about knowing what to expect out of Jalen Tyson than I do Ty Jerome. So I just kind of, I kind of wanted to know where's your game at right now? What's that ankle feeling like? Were you the MVP of September? Those are the things that I just, I don't know. I'm, I'm curious about. Uh, George Niang. So George, of course, came on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. Very much enjoyed talking to George. Very much like George. I know he drew a lot of criticism from fans because he wasn't great in the playoffs. And I don't think that he should have been in the rotation at certain spots because I don't think the matchups made sense and I don't think he was playing well enough. But there was a stretch for him last winter when he was phenomenal, where he was playing what was some of the best basketball of his career. So I want to ask him, how do you replicate that sort of stretch? How can you bring that back? And maybe you're not going to be that good every night. But how can you find a little bit more consistency in your game? That's what I want to know. 
because the Cavs do have room for that kind of player. If he can be consistent and he can shoot 38 to 40% from three at a decent volume, there's room for him. There is. He's helpful. No doubt about it. Sam Merrill, another friend of Locked On Cavs. How do you expect to be used differently under Kenny Atkinson than the previous coaching staff? One of the things that I'm curious about is remember old friend Joe Harris, former member of the Cavs? Well, he was in Brooklyn under Kenny Atkinson. Now, he's a little bit bigger than Sam. I think that they're a little bit different as players. I think Sam is actually capable of doing a little bit more offensively than Joe was. But Joe really broke out under Kenny in Brooklyn. Is Sam going to be used in a similar role? What is his offensive role going to be? That I, I really want to know. I really, really want to know because I think that he is somebody that has a ton of untapped potential. I think that he can be, I think that he can be a a diamond in the rough, if you will, for this Cavs team. I, I really do think that. Craig Porter Jr. What did you learn about yourself last year in your first year in the NBA? Where he experienced a lot of ups and downs. He started the year on a two-way. He ended up on a standard contract. Had that bad ankle injury at the end of the year. But he was somebody that was really good. That in spots, he looked like a really good NBA player. What did he learn about the game? And how did he use that in his offseason preparing for his second season in the NBA? Tristan Thompson. Are you capable of playing 12 to 15 minutes per night if needed? Right now, Tristan Thompson is essentially the third true big. He's the third center, I guess you could say. Maybe you want to say Dean Wade or or George Yang is the third big right now. But Tristan Thompson's the third center. Is he capable of fulfilling that role? I liked what I saw from Double T last year in spurts. He can't be a high minutes player, but I do think that he brings a certain toughness to this team that not many guys do. Some do. I think Max Struess does. I think Donovan Mitchell does. But I think Tristan Thompson does too. I think that is there is there is value in that. All right, lastly, I've got the three guys on two ways. I'm going to go through these quick. But Luke Travers, what are you expecting in your first year in the NBA? Wanted to be in the NBA. He talked openly about thinking he can be an NBA role player. What do you expect this year to be? Amani Bates, when do you think you'll be ready for a standard NBA contract? Does he think he's ready for it now? Does he think it's next year? What does the growth look like for him? I know that he grew a lot in in the G League last year. How much more growth is there left to go in the G League for him? And then lastly, JT Thor. What excites you about the opportunity in Cleveland? Why was Cleveland the right place for you? He is, other than Jalen Tyson, the only outside addition, and it comes on a two-way. But why is he in Cleveland? I, I want to know why he thought Cleveland was the right place to be. I want to say thank you to you for making Locked on Cavs your first listen today and every day. Again, media day is today. Might have a bonus episode today. Um, Might not come out until tomorrow morning. I'm not sure logistically what things are going to look like for me with a flight later on today going down to Florida for training camp. So we'll have to wait and see. But make sure you're subscribed wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, anywhere else. Also, make sure you're checking us out on YouTube. Just search Locked on Cavs on YouTube. Hit that thumbs up button if you're watching. Click subscribe and hit the notification bell. I will talk to you later.